live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to a special edition of Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and tonight we're doing a special show in collaboration with SALT, Social Action Linking Together. It's an advocacy group that's been doing advocacy work here in the Northern Virginia area since 1983. Joining me on this panel is Delegate Ken Plum, Delegate Vivian Watts, and Delegate Marcus Simon. Thank you all for being here. So I wanted to start out by saying, first of all, that the legislature meets, we are a part-time legislature, and we meet either 45 days or 60 days, and there is a veto session. And so the veto session for this year is April 3rd, and this is broadcasting after that veto session. So some of the things we're gonna be talking about will be, at, will be before the veto session, which all of you will be attending on Wednesday, April the 3rd. So I wanna start, um, first of all, with Delegate Plum, who is the most senior member in our House of Delegates. I think your license plate says one. Most senior gentleman in the House. Most, most senior lady in the House. That's right. And so I appreciate the fact that there's a lot of things you've worked on for a long time, but particularly yeah. with SALT. Yeah. And the earned income tax credit is one of those things that we keep making a run at every year, and we don't get very far. Um, but tell us a little bit about what happened this year in some way that is helping to bring some of the money back from a tax windfall to some of our Virginia taxpayers. Right. Well, Catherine and I have to first of all express appreciation to SALT, Social Action Lincoln Together, for the wonderful work that they've done over the years to bring to our attention the fact that while we have it really good up here in Northern Virginia, for the most part, throughout the states that's not the case, and it's not even true totally in Northern Virginia, there are people who don't get to the minimum wage level, there are people who can't make a living wage and so on. What can we do to make up the difference? I'm pleased to say now that there's attention being paid to that in the legislature. For a long period of time, it was a voice in the dark, but now we're making some progress, and I'm pleased with that. One of the approaches that's been, of course, is to raise the minimum wage. We haven't done that recently. Marcus and I, and with Vivian's support, continue to work to make sure that that happens. But short of that, the other approach that some people take, starting back in the 1980s with the Republican administration and Ronald Reagan, was to say that we ought to have people, when they calculate the tax, make a determination with the size of their family, the amount of money withheld, the amount of money that they make in relation to how much it costs to live in the area, to do something that back then was called a negative income tax. You really make sure that people keep all the money that they make that's withheld from them as a way to try to get people up to a more living wage. We made that effort again this year, and I think quite frankly in some regards the reason it may have been delayed was the fact that at the same time we were dealing with the fact that we had some money to spend. And when we had some money to spend, that one of the things you can do as part of that is, in fact, make a refund to taxpayers. And as people uh, file their taxes this year, and it's October, right before the November election comes about, they'll find that they'll actually get some money back from the taxes that were collected. Absolutely. And so some people might actually be surprised, Delegate Watts, when they file their taxes, which many people have not yet, about the impact of the federal income tax reform um, and the fact that the, the Virginia legislature had to match up in the first part of our legislative session this year to make sure that people could actually start filing their taxes in a way that the systems meshed. Mm -hmm. So you have match up and federal. And the feds acted more than a year ago, did not come out with any guidance, any guidance, any guidance. It's November, December, before we meet in January. We still have no guidance. We w personally, we would have preferred a special session so that we could focus on all the complexities of what the feds did. There are, o there are close to 4 million taxes being filed throughout Virginia. There are over hundreds and hundreds of fine print changes in the federal code. And and we were trying in January and February to match those up and try to have our best guess at those who were actually going to be paying higher Virginia taxes because of the federal tax changes. So very quickly, and I did more than one all-nighter, literally <laughs> all-nighter, here's one chart of the many that I tried to produce because a lot of people go tilt over numbers. They're just not going to follow the numbers. But this represents who got impacted most by the estimates of who was going to be paying more. And that is people over of uh, under $50,000 we're going to be paying 4% more on average, and that's 40% of those that are paying more. And less 
of a hit on those uh, between uh, 50 and 125, and less of a hit on those under over 125,000 adjusted gross. So looking at that, we're dealing with how do you return the money to those who are paying the most? And the first plan that we had to deal with on the House side uh, was sending a lot more money to the higher income and very little to this level. And ultimately, the compromise, without going into all of the additional charts that it took to do that, was to take uh, mostly from the Senate version, which dealt with the issue that when it comes to the standard deduction, 50% uh, of the people who are paying the standard deduction earn under $60,000. So if you increase the standard deduction, it is much better targeted at those who are actually paying the increase than what we had to deal with. So that was our first cut was to do that. That was an important change. But then we also were dealing, as Ken has already mentioned, with the fact that because of the way the feds acted, we couldn't do anything prior to people having to file their taxes even as we speak. So what we did out of this estimate is say, okay, come this fall, and I'm not sure yet whether it'll be August or October, there will be a rebate to people uh, based on the taxes that they paid. If you didn't owe any, uh, you won't get anything. You will get up to 220 if you're married, up to 110 if you're single, based on what you've just paid. Now, if I can take one more moment, that then raises the issue that Ken was addressing about earned income tax credit. The earned income tax credit gives a refund if you're a family of a certain size, and these are all people under $50,000, under 30, under, under even under $20,000, uh, you will get a certain credit for that. Now, these people weren't going to get any of the rebate because of this credit. So that what the governor is proposing and what I hope we will pass will at least give to people who are earning the earned income tax credit the difference between what they may have actually paid and up to 220. And that'll call, I, I, I have indication that uh, the money committees think that the amount involved is a doable amount and they, I think it's also been a learning curve Ken understands earned income, income tax credit. A lot of people wouldn't have a clue about it. And so over these months, at least we've begun to get some understanding. And I'll just wrap it by saying the earned income tax credit is actually the third most important way of, of making sure that we, we provide help to those of lower income, with Medicaid and Social Security uh, being the two top, then the earned income tax credit is a very good targeted way of directing money, especially at the families that need it most. And we didn't always have that, did we? No, and with all the complexities that <clears throat> David is mentioning, and it was a complex year, but feds were late in doing what they were doing, what they did was a massive change and so on. With all that happening, I think we have enhanced the understanding of what the earned income tax credit might be, and in fact how it might get us more equity into the system. We have been shuffling money around by what we're going to spend our money on and so on, and how it is we're going to deal with things like rebates or refunds and so on. But we also have to deal with the issue of equity, and equity suggests that you have to take into account not only how much money people make, but what their cost of living might be, a number of members of their family and so on. So, if we made some progress, and, and for the viewers, we will have made some progress in <laughs> August and October. Most folks will get some amount of money back. And beyond that, though, in future years, as we discuss how to get equity into the system, I think we've made a step forward towards that understanding, I hope. I hope so, too. But I think it's terribly named the Earned Income ta Tax Credit, which is referred to as the EITC, which yeah. is even more jargony. I would love to see it called the Working Families Tax Credit. That would work. I, you know, and I think messaging is half the battle when you're yeah. trying to get people to pay attention. But see, messaging in the 80s was to say that you wouldn't give people a handout. You wouldn't give them welfare. You'd give them something they earned. And so that's the connotation and of earned. And they are working families. Yeah. They, they are working families. Important. Important. Right. And, but speaking of working, there are two other quick provisions I want to make sure that the viewers might be comforted by. Uh, one, if you are have 
sent in estimated tax payments over this last year, and now with the changes that the feds have done, oh, I, I, I don't have enough in there. I want to assure the viewers that there will be no penalty if it's in line with what you had withheld the previous year. And there, I've had a number of constituents who've been concerned about that, and again, that is one of the standards for whether you have withheld enough. And then also, uh, while we couldn't have it take effect this year because of the timing of what the feds did, we did remove the cap on what are called what's SALT, which is uh, state and local uh, oh, taxes. taxes. So right. the $10,000 cap of the federal government is one place where we chose not to conform, removing that cap so that people may take their full deduction for real estate and personal property taxes. And that's a nice next year. Not this year because it couldn't be retroactive. Therefore, they're getting the rebate, which is equal to oh, the taxes you might pay at Virginia rates of, at about $3,000 standard deduction. Right. And so that's a nice segue to Delegate Marcus Simon, who can speak quite eloquently to those real estate related tax, personal property tax, real <laughs> estate tax, and why in Northern Virginia particularly, people are concerned about that cap. Yeah, well, no, and here in our area, it's interesting. I mean, Vivian's chart talks about sort of the winners and losers. I mean, step back for just a second. Um, I've watched some of the other episodes. I think we might have the most wonky of the, of the <laughs> panels here. Um, but the you know, big question we had coming in was trying to balance out winners and losers, right? And we didn't want to have the people that won under the Trump tax cuts get the double down, right? And we didn't want to reward the same people that were being rewarded under the Trump tax cuts when it came time to come up with a, how we're going to deal with the state tax windfall. We wanted to sort of spread that out and, and make sure that people under 50,000, people who were losers um, under the tax, Trump tax plan would get some relief at the state level. Uh, where you get to an interesting area where it's a little trickier is here in Northern Virginia, you can make over $125,000 and not feel particularly wealthy or well-to-do, <laughs> right. given our housing costs, given our cost of living and other things. And, and you may be counting, you may have counted on, well, you know, it's okay that it's expensive to live here, um, and it's okay that I've leveraged my $700,000 house with a $500,000 mortgage, because at least I can deduct all that Mortgages from my taxes, deduction. right? And so that's an area where you've got losers who, who kind of, yeah, I don't say losers, but people that get, that get stuck, right? People, right. the stuckies, at both the federal level, and, and we haven't been able to do enough, I don't think, to, to help them at the state level. Although, as Vivian said, by the time we got around to actually passing some legislation, we got past the, the gamesmanship that was going on with conformity, um, we, we have you know, embedded some relief for those folks. Because here, people, you know, they, they, I mean, we have relatively high real estate taxes, not as a rate, but just because of the values of the, the homes. Value the value of properties. Uh, and so people, again, people build their lives and their budgets and their livelihoods on, on you know, counting on the ability to take those deductions. And so uh, we did what little we could to, to give some relief there. And, and again, this brings up a question to Northern Virginia is different from the rest of Virginia. And so when we talk about uh, raising the minimum wage, we talk about a living wage, it's different here than it is in other parts of Virginia. And so the governor of Maryland vetoed a minimum wage, which the legislature recently overturned. So there will be a $15 minimum wage in Maryland. Uh, it'll, they'll, they'll implement it going into 2025, 2026. Amazon HQ2 is coming to Northern Virginia, even though we already have Amazon facilities in Virginia, but they've committed to a nationwide 15% minimum wage. So there are competing interests here because there are small businesses who have an interest. There are people who need a living wage because you can't live in Northern Virginia on $7.25 an hour. Where do you see this going? So you know, it's, it's great that you mentioned Amazon. I'll talk about a couple different things here um, before we have to break. Um, <laughs> the, um, the minimum wage, so, so Delegate Plum and I have both for years been putting in minimum wage bills. Um, I had a bill that would have gotten us to $15 an hour uh, over a period of time, similar to what Maryland actually just passed. I think mine was maybe a little more ambitious. I think by 2023 we'd be there. They'll be there by 2025. But the, the phased in approach was a recognition that we don't want to cause a shock to the system and that you know, it, you know, small businesses need time to adjust. They need time to change their practices, uh, to make decisions about how they're going to figure out how, their, their overall compensation and to plan for it. I mean, I'm a small business owner myself. I've got a real estate title firm. Uh, we've got about 40, 45 employees at any given time. And so we need to know what's coming and we can plan for it, budget for it, and, and, and you know, get ready to adjust. So I thought that was an important concession to the business community. Um, you know, Amazon is a big company. They can afford to pay everybody $15 an hour. 
there's some talk about you know, maybe creating a carve out, and I think there is going to be an ex there are exceptions for family owned businesses that only hire their relatives and things like that, where it's sort of a you know the a family enterprise, right, where everybody does better when the company does better. So too, too bad you don't have more kids. <laughs> right, there you go. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll have some exceptions there, but you know that that you know didn't get very far. In fact, um, you know. I think on one of your earlier episodes, but yeah, that's one of the opportunities that Republicans took to sort of play some games, and they'd like to try and drive wedges. Uh, where I, I'd be partisan here, but we're all Democrats. You can be partisan. Here. <laughs> so um, yeah, they, they look for things like that to try and drive wedges between uh, the Chamber of Commerce and small business owners and and, the, and Democratic mainline activists. And so you know, they like to exaggerate some of the drawbacks of the minimum wage and, and call us radicals and socialists and other names. Um, and so they had a test vote on that. I think in the Senate, um, I don't think they did it in the House because I think amongst you know most of our Democrats, it's a pretty popular issue. I think if they you know look at the polling, um, you know with some some exceptions, most people support the idea of, of a living wage uh, and that you know people that work one job ought to be able to live with some dignity uh, and be compensated in a way that allows them to live uh, without having a need for public assistance or to hold down a second or third job, uh, be able to afford decent childcare for their kids, um, and just provide a decent quality of life for their families. So, and that's the thing that SALT really focuses on, is, is better public policy and delivering better human services to the people who are in the most vulnerable communities or the most vulnerable in a community. But let's talk a little bit about how the game is played, how the sausage is made, because the Republicans have a majority of one seat in both the House and the Senate, but that gives them great power in doing uh, committee assignments, which are always going to be a majority of Republicans sometimes to a greater or lesser extent, but always a majority. So a lot of times, uh, bills never make it to the floor for a vote, or bills will come out of the Senate and they'll get hung up in the House. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that kind of happens a fair amount. Yep. Um, yeah. And a lot of that is committee assignments, even what committee the bills are assigned to. And this year I saw two new wrinkles that I'd never seen before. One of those is the use of the Rules Committee, where some bills had been sent to Rules Committee in the past because the Rules Committee is the one committee that is, doesn't even pretend to be apportioned uh, com uh, with the 49-51 split. I think the split is nine to six. If I can, you're on Rules yeah, Committee, but it's close it's, to yeah, that. Close so, to that. But what this year, they, what they did was that they sent, hmm, I would say easily four, five, six times as many bills to rules committee and then never heard them and in particular the tax bills bills such as my bill which is pretty close to where we ended up on the compromise got put into rules and was never heard and most importantly never had a fiscal impact statement so there was no way that I could have professionally costed out by tax department staff what each provision would in fact uh, uh, cost and all of these bills were kept in rules committee and again most important not not just not that they weren't heard but they weren't even analyzed so we couldn't work with them and then the other thing that that has been happening uh, apportionment a sub subcommittee might be three Republicans to two Democrats because after all it's one more. Well just in case that's not enough we're going to have the full committee chairman always has the right to vote on a subcommittee and what I found this year is that almost without exception full committee chairmen were there to vote whereas in the past it was rare so that there wasn't a chance for getting things like gun legislation out of subcommittee. So let me jump in here for a second. So I'm the uh, House Democratic Caucus parliamentarian, so I've tried to learn the rules. And, and um, what's interesting is when we get to 4951, uh, in some ways, rather than getting more clever uh, on the other side, they've just gotten more uh, ham handed and just you know, very clear, you know, blatant in, in their raw exercise of power. Um, and so they also play some games. You know, we talk about the math problem. So, you know, what we'll do as near as we can, but we'll round up in favor of the majority. And so most subcommittees have an even number of people, so you can't get within one. And then on top of that, they have the committee chair sit as an ex officio. So if one of their people have to go to the bathroom or leave, he'll step in and vote. So they'll always have at least that two member majority. And it's funny, I pointed it out to the chairman of privileges and elections because he was voting. And I said, Mr. Chairman, yeah, I'm sorry, but I. According to the rules, you're only supposed to vote if somebody's absent. He's like, well, the clerk's not counting my vote. I'm like, well, then why are you voting? He's like, well, how else are the other members supposed to know how to vote if they don't see what I do first? Wow, that's pretty blatant. <laughs> so uh, he was sort of 
a little tongue in cheek, but yeah. you know, it's like one of those, it's funny because it's true um, kind of a thing. So, I mean, they did that with judges. I mean, you know, they can appoint judges. We got a um, Supreme Court justice. Yeah, they just told us the day before this is who it's going to be. And that's on the uh, State Corporation Commission as well, we had a judge. And that's a really powerful position in Virginia. We've been trying for a year to find somebody suitable. And one afternoon, we, we got word that there's going to be a, a hearing of Commerce and Labor tomorrow morning at 8.30 to qualify the candidate. And then that afternoon, we voted on them and we jumped up and down. And, and the fact is, you know, they all voted in lockstep, 51-49, to approve the judge. So that kind of thing but does most still of them happen. didn't even know who the leader. I mean, it was very, <laughs> well, it was very closely held well, uh, by the leadership. For example, the, in the Rules Committee, what's been mentioned, it, it not only is a disproportionate relation to Republicans and Democrats, but the, rule, the uh, Speaker of the House chairs the committee. The Speaker of the House makes other committee assignments. He assigns bills to committees. So when he assigns the bill, the Rules Committee, you know, it's going to be up to him whether it's going to be heard or not, or whether he's going to send it someplace else. Now, what could we as six members of a 15-member committee do? We could cry and we could beg and we could plead. But the fact of the matter is the system is, is structured for the leadership to control it. Right. Which and is why it's important for the, 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 that we, you know, we have elections coming up in 2019. Right, we do. And we're going to have the opportunity to change control of both houses. We're within one seat in either house. So we just need to swing two, two seats. And um, it's funny, watching our freshman class, we had a really big and very enthusiastic freshman class. The freshman class 15 in 2017. And they were just you know, gung-ho. And they had, they said, I've talked to some Republicans on the other side. And I know that I can probably get two or three of them to go along with this idea. I just sort of said, OK. Yeah. You know, they're like, I'm like, it doesn't exactly work that way. But they're very experiential learners. They kind of had to see it for themselves. And I have to throw in from my nerdy self, who's been at this an embarrassingly long time, <laughs> I have built my body of knowledge step by step by step. And what I don't like is the, the fact that we're not building that knowledge. If you don't even analyze the bill, but truly just deep six it, if you announce the night before that you're going to have a public hearing the next morning on an extraordinarily important position for the SCC, that is hiding, that is not even working on full information, not to mention hiding it. And the last thing I'll say, I'm sorry about that, because I, I get nerdy about the part of the, the Go ahead. Bill. No, but part of the reason we've seen this big uptick um, in uh, bills that don't get heard or don't get analyzed is we, we, were, we did extract some concessions during the initial rules negotiation about having some near proportionality on the committees, but also on having votes, recorded votes. Uh -huh. So the Republicans wanted to talk about and brag about how they want to be very transparent. They're going to, they'll be the party to have recorded votes at subcommittees. Well, if they don't want to have a recorded vote, they just don't, don't hear, hear the bill at all. And so it used to be that at least we'd, we'd hear it, we'd sort of suss it out. We'd, we could, you know, you'd learn from year to year to year on the earned income tax, but you sort of hear what the objections were. And so you come back the next year and say, hey, last year you guys said that this was the problem. Here's how this year's bill addresses it. Uh, you know, fair housing, you know, is another one of those where I remember the first year I brought uh, a bill to, um, a, to incl include sexual orientation and gender identity right. in a fair housing statute. And they said, well, you know, do you really even have a problem, delegates? I mean, you, you haven't brought us any evidence that shows that, that <sighs> homosexual people. Don't even tell me who that was. Right? Uh, Todd so, Gilbert. So, um, so we came back the next year with home, mm -hmm. uh, housing opportunities made equal, and they did a study based on that. And so we said, well, here's actually, you know, we did a blind, double blind study, and here's the statistical evidence that people are being discriminated against. And it's like, well, you don't have a religious exemption. So we came back last year and said, well, here's why states that have religious exemptions, it doesn't really change anything. And then finally just stopped hearing it. <laughs> I know, because, because all the LGBT bills got put into rules. Mm -hmm. right. I think they originally got out only to be killed. But, you know, this is one where, um, you know, 80% of Virginians are behind employment non-discrimination for the LGBT community and in housing and in public accommodation. That would have the floor votes in both chambers, no question, because the Senate has voted on them before. But this kind of game playing with putting, sticking them in the rules committee, it, it's, it's discouraging, I well, think. And, and they released it to general laws, and then they, without enough time, like with two days to go, and then the committee said, well, I would have loved to hear it. We just ran out of, you know, claim we ran out of time on the clock. Well, they ran out the clock, but you're holding the ball. So. Yeah, I know, because I was in that, we crowded the corridor. I was with the Equality Virginia people. You know, and that, there's so many things that are being tried by average citizens. One of them is Facebook living the votes of subcommittees which previously not only were not broadcast, but the votes weren't recorded. And so now you've got organizations that are coming there. People are showing up from grassroots organizations, and they're broadcasting these meetings. And, but, but maybe the, the backlash to that 
is the fact that now they've just decided they won't hear the bills at all. That's right. Yeah, but yeah. let's make sure the message is clear to our constituents, particularly our good friends from SALT. You got to stay at this. You know, those right. of us who've been here for a while recognize you do bring about change. Yeah. We and had no hate crime bill in Virginia when I originally started out. Right. We got a hate crime bill. It doesn't. It's not as broad as it should be. We continue to work on that. So sometimes the things take longer than we would hope they would, but because they take longer doesn't mean we give up on the calls. We simply work harder. And I would just add, while this isn't a SALT issue, I serve on the Criminal Law Subcommittee of Courts, which is a very interesting assignment. I've learned about things I never thought I needed to know about over the years. But I've certainly been involved with cannabinoid oil and its, yes. its benefits for seizures, et cetera. But now we're dealing with uh, marijuana as in recreational use. So while it was a short session and at least we voted on the bills, even though we didn't have good discussion of it at all, but the important thing is now the general public who are very interested in this subject or any subject, as Ken is saying, they now have my vote and they have everybody else's vote. I say this because I happen to be the only one who voted uh, against legalization but for criminalization. You had people voting just for legalization or just or, or no period. And I said, no, decriminalization, I think this is a direction that we could go because of what it does to people's records, et cetera. So now I find myself not only getting a tremendous amount of focus and, and discussion about it, but I'm learning. That's the important thing in holding your elected officials accountable is that following in the way that Ken is saying that you can then continue to educate your elected officials uh, if you have at least the transparency of votes on issues rather than just deep sixing them. And I know that all of you reach out to your constituents, whether it's on social media, newsletters, that on, on, particularly during session because I get a lot of them. But that is a great way of telling people what you're working on, where it is, whether it's passed, whether it's been tabled for the year. And I think that if people are not currently following legislators in any method, they're really, you're really missing out on participating in the legislative process, particularly about things that you care about in your own community. I'm very proud to say that, that my daughter Allison is Delegate Plum's constituent and follows him religiously. She's always reposting things from her delegate. So we're going to take a break. When we come back, I want people to stay tuned. We're going to be talking with these three delegates from our legislature about some of the issues that are impacting some of the most marginalized and vulnerable people in our community, not just here in Northern Virginia, but vulnerable people throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. So please stay tuned and join us after the break. Operation Wonder Park is a go! There's nothing more powerful than imagination. Honey, have you seen my cell phone? But don't just imagine. My park came to life? Ooh, a plot twist! Use STEM to build. Ta -da! <gasps> create. She did it! And change the world. Who's with me? I'm more of a two feet on the ground kind of guy. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, it's gonna hurt tomorrow. If she can STEM, so can you. Find out more at She Can STEM. it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. They told me a bottle couldn't dream. That I would never become a superhero. But I learned how to fly. Just to come back in a new disguise. And be the hero that I've always wanted to be. Scoop. Here again, your host. 
Welcome back to a special edition of Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and we are doing a special show in collaboration with SALT, Social Action Linking Together, an advocacy group here in Northern Virginia that's been advocating for some of the most marginalized people in our community since 1983. Joining me is Delegate Ken Plum, Delegate Vivian Watts, and Delegate Marcus Simon. Thank you all for being here. Of course. So we were talking just a little bit about Amazon in the last segment, and you, there's a lot of um, interest in Amazon, but it's both good and bad, right? So we think, like, we landed it. Queens has decided they don't want it. There's been a lot of debate about incentives, um, corporate welfare, I mean, whatever you want to call it sure. or people are calling it. But, but it is good for our region, but there are a lot of considerations here. Right. So, I mean, first of all, I, I think it's a great get for the area. I'm in that camp. I think it's good for us. I think that putting it in Crystal City, I mean, National Landing, whatever you want to call it, it's Landing. a good Terrible spot for it. Because, I mean, a lot of those, what a lot of people don't understand is they see those and those office buildings and think that there's already a lot of stuff there. They don't realize how many of those are, are empty and were emptied out during the BRAC. Uh, the other thing about the deal, which I really like, is that all the incentives that get paid to Amazon. Now, there's a big package, um, a lot of which is actually spent on, on things that we'll all benefit from, like moving a Virginia Tech campus and putting it in national right. land, in Potomac Yard, uh, adding um, entrances to our metro, you know, things that we wouldn't do if you weren't getting a big company that was going to bring people. But those are public sort of expenditures that we all get. Amazon said you know, they had to have, but we all benefit from that. But the money that goes directly to Amazon, the way it's been explained to me, and I think it works, is, you know, they create a job that pays $150,000 a year. We know roughly what that means in income taxes to Virginia. So after that job's been around for two years, Amazon says we want some back, right? We want a commission. You know, we, we created this revenue for you that you wouldn't have but for our being here. Uh, and so we want to be paid back a portion of that as a tax credit, as a tax incentive. Uh, after the job's created, after we know it's generated the revenue to the company, and we were all told it's going to be, it's going to cost us nothing. Uh, and that sounds really good to me. I like that deal. Uh, but then this year in our budget, uh, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee said, well, we're going to take a, create a special $40 you know, Amazon Incentives Fund, and we'll use it you know, with uh, internet sales tax revenue, which we're going to be getting for the first time, right. right? because of the wafer decision. And we'll set some of that aside to pay for the incentives in case the money's not there later. And, and I'm like, how could the money not be there later? Right? You told us that we only have to pay these incentives if they create the jobs and the jobs have been around and they've paid the taxes and then we give it to them. So to me, that just felt more like a, a slush fund, right? Like, you know, we've got some money right now. We're getting a windfall from the federal taxes, all the things we've talked about we can use to pay for rebates or for earned income tax credit or for other priorities. And instead of wanting to spend it, he just wants to sort of, you know, again, and this wafer money is, is new money, right? New right. revenue. So we want to squirrel it away for something. Uh, the governor said, no, we're not doing that. We've got other things that we could spend that money on now. Because when you take money from sales tax, I mean, it's literally money that we could be spending. He said, well, Amazon's not getting it, right? We're going to put it in a special fund. Well, but it's money that could be going now to fund what sales tax is supposed to fund, which is education, transportation, local governments, all benefit from sales tax. So I, I made a bit of a stink about that, in the, along with others. In the you know, Washington Business Journal reported on it. I think the governor got the, the news, and, and so hopefully you know, we'll do away with that piece of it. And we'll pay incent, you know, Amazon the incentives after they've created the revenue. Right. And then one of the things that I did love is that we, for all of the incentives that may have been given now or be, will be shared in the future, we spent just as much money on higher education funding. You That's mentioned right. the, mm -hmm. the Virginia Tech Center and there's other money given to other universities. Mm -hmm. So we are investing in workforce development, not just providing a place for Amazon. From way back in my citizen days when I also was focusing on taxes then, I never liked this bidding war. So as I look at deals, this is the best, pretty much the best I've ever seen as far as being a win-win and making sure that you have money in hand. And as far as transportation, which is another focus that I've paid a lot of attention to, the fact that 30% will be coming from across the river to have the jobs so that you're using uh, the capacity of Metro for that. There's a lot of good uh, that is part of it. But just to comment on what uh, Marcus was saying, I don't know where truth lies, but one of the concerns of our budget committee is that we've had a AAA bond rating forever, but our bond rating houses are saying we don't have as much in reserve as they believe that we should have. Exactly. And so this is one of the reasons why uh, there continues to be that focus. 
On the positive, another positive side, though, about reserves, which we didn't mention in our tax discussion, is there is a taxpayer relief fund because we just don't know how this whole federal state tax reform is going to work out. So we are setting aside any additional money for additional reform, and hopefully we can get earned income tax credit, for example, uh, back into the mix of the kind of reform we need to be doing. So this is a very fluid situation. Uh, also, add to that whatever's happening in Congress, whatever they sneeze, we get a cold because 30% of our economy is tied the directly or indirectly to the federal government. So this is another issue about reserves and finally why it was so important to have a, an employer like Amazon who might also attract others to broaden our tax base away from its dependence on the federal government. And to put it in the larger context of Virginia, it's important for us to understand that we have in our region the wealthiest communities in the United States of America, right here in Northern Virginia. If you were to go south in Virginia and look at South Side and Southwest Virginia, you would have among the poorest communities in the nation, right down there with Mississippi. All that in the Commonwealth. So you then try to take these divergent interests and put them together. Obviously, we want economic development, we want good jobs for our people, we want education and so on. That's going to be attracted to Northern Virginia first. But we need also to look at how it is that we can take those gains of Northern Virginia and bring up the whole level of the state so that some of those costs that we now may uh, have as a result of the poorer communities can come to better balance of themselves. And that's the challenge. There's no easy answer to all that. But we have to remember when we talk about our needs here, there's a whole range of needs, and we somehow have to accommodate those to get an agreement in the legislature and going forward. No, I agree. And I think one of the greatest assets the Commonwealth has is that we have 23 community colleges, more so than many, many other states. Yeah. And they're spread out. It's a, it's a big it's a big piece of land, the Commonwealth of Virginia, yep. but 23 community colleges also give us opportunities, and I have seen more interest in trying to figure out what we can do more and better for job retraining, upskilling, and preparing people for jobs of the 21st century that pay a living wage. Cybersecurity, for example, mm -hmm. as a, for instance, $80,000 a year jobs. We now have those spread starting at Northern Virginia Community College across the community college system. We know the jobs are coming. Many of them are available already. Uh, we can do that in a community college level program. That's going to be a real plus for Virginia over the years. And in the community colleges in particular, as we've started to look more at degree certificates rather than the full four years, as a direct reflection of about two years ago, a study that Virginia did, that for this workforce in the next 20 years, for every PhD that we need, we're going to need two bachelor degrees and seven that have more than four years of high school but less than four years of college. So it's this retraining, this apprenticeship, this targeting to where the markets are that that particular study I think really unleashed in looking at the, uh, the dynamic potential that community colleges represent as well as our veteran workforce uh, where we can give better credit for what they have done in the military and help uh, expedite uh, the degrees that uh, will better utilize that uh, training. And is this an area where there is some bipartisan support? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think so. I mean, and you know, I know the speakers made sort of a big deal and, and wanting to take credit for it on the Republican side about trying to match up the needs of the business community with the, the students and the degrees that we're producing. And I think it's important that we, we have some sensitivity to that and you know, we understand and react to market forces and turn out the, 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 um, the, the product essentially that they want. But I do think we need to be a little bit careful about treating our, our students too much as a product, right? And I think there is still some value in a good liberal arts education. And, and we don't want to lose too much of the focus on the whole child, the whole person. Um, because the other critique from the, other, you know, from the far left or the other side of the spectrum is that you know, we're just basically providing free job training for Amazon, right? Yeah, yeah, sure, these are public benefits, but you know, now they don't have to pay to train their employees because you know, we put a university there and we're going to use public dollars to train their employees and their workforce for them. Um, so again, I still think that the net benefit's there. Um, but I think that this is, generally speaking, I think we're a place where all of us can agree that we can be more business friendly 
by spending money and providing services and not by being very austere or denying workers a, you know, you know, a living wage and other things. And I will only throw in not only working closely with business as far as we do have a strong apprenticeship with a number of businesses throughout the Commonwealth, but also with labor. Yep. That this is where you train the workforce, particularly the workforce that is beginning to age out and the skilled workers are now in their 40s and 50s and there's not what there should be coming up behind in a, a lot of professions. The other issue in all this is the matter of equity in terms of particularly the children in need in the schools. Uh, the part of the debate this year was if we were to reduce public education, which by gosh and we need to know that we want to raise teachers uh, pay to 5% yes. and we did the state share of that. Now it's up to localities to match that to make it happen. But beyond that then how do we de take children with special needs in Fairfax County schools? They don't have to be labeled with a disability. They can simply be uh, limited learners, uh, slow learners, or whatever. How do we get the equity into this system to make that happen? And I'm pleased to say, largely as a result of some of our freshman members in the House of Delegates, we're addressing that issue of equity. It's not simply did you spend this money last year and this year you're going to spend X plus a dollar. No, it means that what we're going to do is we're going to look more comprehensively at what the student needs are and respond to those, which means sometimes you need special programs to meet special needs. And that takes into account the diversity of our community, the minority populations, and so on. We made a little step forward this year, I thought, and I thought the movement and the thought of doing that is important in and of itself, and we can build on it in the future. Not just more money for education, but some money to take into account the inequities in the education system as it develops now. And you've hit on something, too, about education, what's needed there, and that is mental health services and guidance counselors. Oh, not just upping the number of student resource officers, yeah. but addressing the problem of behavioral problems, and that is mental health supports. And that is also related to the community services boards being able to provide real-time, immediate services to people who are in a crisis. The unfortunate experience of Senator Deeds dramatized for us better than anything we've ever had about what the need for immediate services in the mental health area is. You can't simply have a diagnosis that somebody's in a crisis if you have no response to that crisis. If it's to go back home and come back tomorrow, you're in deep trouble. Again, largely a result of the effort that Senator Deeds and his commission has been doing, we're making steps forward towards making sure that crisis resource centers and thank God we have a good supply of them here in Northern Virginia because we put a lot of local money into the matter. But throughout the state then, we can have a response to a crisis for somebody in mental ill, or the, mental ill. The context, though, for what Ken has just said, I serve both on the Deeds Commission, as it's been approximately four years, as well as having been appointed to the School Safety Select Committee, uh, which I think to a number of members who hadn't had the experience in the schools realized what a mental health need that we have, that it's not just hardening the buildings, but this is where the recognition of the importance of true guidance counselors, not guidance for college, but for life, that 80% of their time needs to be spent on counseling because the threat assessments, uh, because we go all the way back to having established a threat ath assessment ability to uh, the tragedy of Virginia Tech, means that we're far ahead of many sta states in recognizing this, but the threat assessment statistics clearly show that half of the students, it's because they are danger to self. Right. rather than to others and this really underscored our mental health needs but once you do that the real context to everything that Ken said and that I said is that we tend to react to the crisis and then move on and don't sustain the funding everything that was put in place following Virginia Tech did not continue to be funded it was dissipated here here and here before you then have the next and the next and the next so the deeds commission the importance there and I do hope it'll be a permanent uh, commission so that we don't take the spotlight away from the needs not just within the schools obviously but even within the schools even as low as elementary schools there will be some students who have psychotic or depression or other issues that need to be dealt with in a true mental health professional community and that integration with the community service boards is right along with what was discovered 
uh, through the tragedy that, that Deeds in losing his son discovered that there's not the responsiveness when someone is in mental health crisis. Now what we're dealing with from that, as we've seen all the statistics on the Deeds Commission, is now though our state hospitals are becoming the first responder for someone in crisis. And so we are overloaded and overloaded on our hospitals. And then some who could be released into community services, those services aren't there. We have a significant challenge. And above all, we cannot uh, look away again as we have in the past. We've been kind of conservative, I think, in Virginia on spending just on health care in general, general, but certainly mental health services. Am I wrong? I think we're kind of conservative. Yeah, no, I think that that's part of the problem. I mean, we're tight about it. And the other thing is, to just sort of piggyback on what Vivian's saying, is we kind of we, we react to the most recent crisis and we try to solve that problem. But if you don't add resources to it, you're just taking from one area to the other, right? So we, we put mandates on hospitals and having to make beds available after the deeds yeah, situation. The, but you didn't give them a, uh, we, we would, the problem was we created the door in, we widened the door in, but we didn't have a door out, right? So there's no community-based service, there's no way to step people down and out. So those, the, the, the hospitals get overcrowded. And then we have another tragedy in our one of our jails a few years ago because somebody had yes. been gone to the Portsmouth jail and was supposed to be referred out to a, a hospital, but there was no bed for him there because we had said that the priority is gonna be on the, the Gus Deeds situations. And so the people, well, at least he's in a prison and so we'll just leave him there until he wait, literally died and wasted away. Uh, so, you know, you can't solve these problems. You can't just lurch from one crisis to the next to the next without taking a larger look, which I think was what the Deeds Commission tries to do. But then also, there's got to be, you got to own it, right? You got to say, look, this is going to require more resources. We've got to grow the pie. We can't just keep shifting it around. And we had a crisis right here in, in uh, Fairfax County at that same time. Yep. Natasha McKenna, who in her 30s, she had been an honor student at Woodson High School, which happened to be where my kids went. And yet she died in a jail setting waiting for over five days uh, to be transferred and not having any mental health services during that time. Our jails now uh, have approximately 20% of their population is uh, has a diagnosed mental illness and they are not equipped for it. And yet we have gone again, partly because as, as Marcus has said, without the community services, they end up in jail instead. Uh, back in the day, I'm not, I don't want to come back to institutions, but there was a time when there were only about 2% in jail and the rest were in institutions. That's true. We closed the institutions we did. and we didn't provide the services, services that, were that community people based. need when they're in crisis. So community-based services. Because there is, a, there is a point, and the Justice Department has made it, that institutions are not a good setting. No. And, and with our juvenile justice system, we have finally embraced the fact that juveniles should not all be put in an institution far from home. You know, we should, we should do intervisions at the lowest possible level closest to where people live. Mm -hmm. And I think we kind of have turned the corner. I do think it's going to come down to a matter of are we funding it adequately. Can we talk about, just for a second, I know you're the moderator here. But, <laughs> Go but, ahead. But can we talk about uh, a crisis? You know, it, it, all this talks brings me about one thing that really hasn't changed here in Richmond. Uh, and it, when we watched this crisis unfold in Christchurch, New Zealand, and when somebody oh, yes. went into a church with yes. a semi-automatic weapon and mowed people down, the parliament in New Zealand you know, the next Monday you know, went to work and said these dangerous guns don't have any place in our society. There, there's no real good reason to have them. And they enacted you know, tough, meaningful uh, gun violence prevention measures instantly. And they made them effective immediately so people wouldn't go stockpiling, do all those things. Um, it really made me, you know, uh, almost in some ways increased my frustration with what we do here in Virginia because that's one area where and we talked about some things that have some bipartisan support where we've been able to work together <laughs> having narrowed the gap and the, the successes of some of our freshmen. But that's one area which is almost like a religious dogma for the Republicans in Richmond. And, and Ken and I, and I know Vivian, have put forward bills to do simple things like universal background checks. Uh, so that every purchaser gets vetted, so you're not putting guns in the hands of dangerous people. Uh, you know, we had a, a red flag law that the Trump administration supports, uh, a bump stock law that, frankly, the Trump administration eventually went ahead and did administratively. We couldn't get those things passed in the Virginia legislature. We we do get a hearing on those because they, they have to have a show hearing for their you know, rabid base to see them killing all those bills. Uh, but that's one place where I think until we get some change in leadership, we're not going to have much success. I think there were 30 bills this year that were all killed. Mm -hmm. It was one afternoon 
and you could have predicted from the beginning, and we've been through this scenario every year, you get a chance to present your bill. I've been doing the universal background check for bill for years. About a dozen people representing associations, not themselves, or representing associations of people get up and say why it is that this is needed and why they support us and all. Two people on the other side get up. One says he's from the NRA, we don't think we should do this. It's the other's Virginia Civil Defense League, don't think we should do this. And that's what the circumstance is. The, the uh, chair then calls for a vote. Predictably, it's the case, four to two. Right. Four people with straight A ra rankings by the NRA and two others who happen to get assigned to that committee, and the bills go on. That's why, and I want to go back to something I said earlier, uh, part of the show, is that the advocacy on the part of citizens is so important. It gets frustrating. I don't get any pleasure out of going back and banging my head against the wall again. So what is it that can cause these things to move forward? Well, it can be, and as I've said to people in my district, we need to go outside of my district and work with some people who can work with me on these issues so we can get them, get them done. All right. And secondly, we can then in the generally uh, educate the public to the fact that their actions and their advocacy can make a difference. They can add to our voices. Uh, we don't want to be the exclusive voice of what we're talking about. We want to be the, the leader to say this is what the public is saying. And so the interest of citizens in what we're doing, it's not our job simply to do it. We're part of a, a, a greater movement. And we encourage people to get involved with us and help us out. And again, I praise SALT as one example of how it's done, but there are many other organizations as well. Ligaman Voters has been at it for a long, long, long time. time. And uh, they do a wonderful job, but, but we do need that enforcement from the community to say this is what we want to do. And particularly come November election time, that True. people who go from the, winning the election to the legislature go with a different point of view. That's when we're going to take, really take action. But also, I know you'll agree, Ken, that the third factor is redistricting. That yes. when you pack districts so that the, the control goes to the primary rather than the general election, and you have low turnout primaries that are driven by oftentimes single issue voters, that too has definitely made a difference in the climate that we have to deal with. I put in my first redistricting bill, independent redistricting I know, bill in 1982. I, said, I know you, <laughs> 1982. I've been working on this issue forever, Absolutely. and it really is something that we have to do. To but we've got traction, unlike the gun bills. We've gotten a little bit of traction on redistricting and a nonpartisan commission. You know, it looks like the, between the Supreme Court hearing cases in Virginia, we do have districts that were redrawn, but there's still kind of a question mark in the air between now and Election Day as to which districts people will be voting in. We won't know until the Supreme Court uh, gives a ruling on the uh, Republican um, petition to stay the uh, what the lower federal court did uh, to finally re redraw. We've given you chance after chance after chance to deal with the packing of blacks that uh, occurred in the House districts, and so they finally withdrew the line, but still the Supreme Court heard their, their uh, petition for a stay on that. I personally think that uh, the the fact that the Supreme Court is hearing other uh, election decisions is why they held it. I think that uh, it may be as late as June, but I think those new those redistricts of about 23 districts, all of which were affected by the 11 that were packed as black districts, will in fact be uh, what the districts will be in November. I just want to be real clear about real, just a small word. So the Republicans' request for a stay, meaning that to not have us move forward with the new maps, was denied by the Supreme Court. They would not issue a stay. So everybody Standing, right now is right. everybody right now is is campaigning. Um, as if they're going to be the new districts, but in the back of their mind, the thought that we might have to redo this again. We may have to, I mean, or, you know, we have to delay our primaries till September if the Supreme Court comes down the other way, uh, or even redo them, which seems sort of unthinkable, but it could happen that way. Uh, but I think the fact that they wouldn't issue a stay, uh, and really the issue that they, they wanted to hear more standing. about was standing, whether it is that legislators can say, I don't like the districts that were drawn for me, uh, or I do like them, and I don't want you know, do they really have the standing to, to, to intervene when the, the, you know, the Attorney General and the Governor have said we're not appealing this decision. And that's a matter of not race, but partisanship. It comes down to can you redraw, if you're the, if you're the party in power, can you redraw the lines for incumbency mm -hmm. to benefit yourself? Whereas what we have in the Independent Commission, and we're at an critical time, where we have passed a version 
there's going to be an election if we pass that exact same version for a uh, redistricting commission, then it'll go before the voters before our next redistricting. And that commission, as I would describe it, is set up to balance, counterbalance, balance, counterbalance in a number of different ways. It's not independent as some people have advocated that it be totally independent of the legislature, but as far as the legislative and citizen uh, and the votes required, equal number of legislators, equal number of citizens, uh, legislators are, are chosen by their parties within the House and the Senate rather than by the, the Speaker, which would perpetuate the current majority. There has to be six out of eight of the legislators that support it. I believe there have to be six out of the citizens, citizens who support any plan that is then put before the legislature. If we don't come up with it, uh, don't approve it without amendment, so we can't play around with right, it. Right, it has to be exact. Uh, then they come back with another one. If we still don't approve it without amendment, then it goes to the Supreme Court. So it is, compared to where we have been, it is major project progress. And I just do want to mention, we've only got a, a couple of minutes left. I want to mention some very important things. The census is coming up in 2020. The governor has a commission on the census. There are local committees around the census to make sure every single person is counted because the, the districts will be drawn based on population in 2021. Because we have off-year elections in Virginia, we will have the first governor's race after the presidential election, so it matters that this census data be correct. And I also want to point out that 2019 is an election year. All three of you are up for re-election, every member of the Senate, every member of the House, as well as constitutional offices, sheriffs, commonwealth attorneys, board of supervisors, and school board. And every single one of these elections is important. I think the most important thing we can do to advance SALT's issues and the issues that they care about is to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to vote in, in a meaningful way in a district that reflects their, you know, where their vote will count. Um, and so I think if you guys could focus on one issue, frankly, voting rights, access to the ballot box, fair districts, um, you know, no barriers, no photo IDs that are unnecessary. If we get everybody voting, you know, most people agree with us and we'll get, we'll get the results that we're looking for. I agree. And so I'm wishing all of you uh, a return to the legislature so that we can do the uh, wrap up again next year in 2020. Um, this has been enlightening for me. You're right, Marcus, a very wonky group of people, <laughs> the most senior members of the legislature, too. And this is very important for people at home to understand how to engage, both with you as legislators. Please get engaged in your community. This is an election year. Um, SALT, Social Action Linking Together, is an advocacy organization in this area. Get involved with SALT. Understand how you can impact good public policy for the most vulnerable people in your own community.